so it is 7.03 and I think we are ready to get started. We have a wonderful group on and this is recorded uh, because it is of course for uh, the Con Ed course that's coming up and we're very excited about a program that you and Andrew uh, put together for IHN and all of your happy colleagues and soon to be colleagues. Um, who are at um, who are in uh, school training right now? So we're pretty excited. Your your reputation precedes you, Catherine. We all love you very much at uh, IHN and the courses that you teach. So, um, as always, um, I'm one of the five hosts at IHN, and uh, my name is Julia Rickert, and I produce the Con Ed, the post grad uh, lectures, the guest speaker series, and I am excited to be here this evening to bring you Catherine Brunner and Andrew, who I was calling Mason, as in Jar, for the first uh, 10 minutes of our call this evening. So forgive me, Andrew. Um, the two of them have been working together for a long time. Andrew is an avid fermenter. Now, I've just met him this evening, uh, but I've heard of him uh, through Catherine, and I think that justice will be served if uh, Catherine introduces herself. Again, many of you, almost 90% on the call this evening know who our beloved Catherine is and and, and she will give us a um, she or Andrew of course will introduce <laughs> himself so we are ready Woo! let's do it great thank you so much everyone thanks for attending and spending your part of your evening with us um, my name is Catherine I've been an instructor at IHM for several years now and Andrew and I have been fermenting together for well over a decade over a decade mm -hmm. for certain <laughs> um, we've been teaching fermentation in the GTA for a decade mm -hmm. so um we were certainly fermenting before that I think um the first time we kind of came across the the benefits and the idea of fermenting uh, we were traveling, uh, I think we were in Thailand, and we came across a uh, kombucha, a restaurant that was serving all these different kombuchas. And uh, we, we researched it, we saw the benefits of having fermented foods on a daily basis. And we kind of, we came home and we said, okay, how do we, how do we do this? Because when we went to the shop, it was four or five bucks a bottle for kombucha. And we were like, well, this is too expensive if we're supposed to be having it every day. Uh, so we said, let's figure out how to make this. And we bought a bottle of raw kombucha and we created our own mother over about a three seven weeks. Yeah, okay, so seven weeks. We, we fed tea and sugar to uh, just some liquid at first and eventually it just started developing a kombucha mother, a SCOBY and we developed it ourselves and learned all about it ourselves, our own research. And um, we kind of said to ourselves, we've just taught ourselves how to do this. Why can't we teach other people how to do this? And we, we went on the venture of um, wanting to teach people how to brew their own kombucha. And that, that turned into, it, it was a gateway drug for <laughs> us. We, we, we ferment everything from vinegar to miso kimchi, nuts and mm -hmm. legumes. So um, it's been a ton of fun. It's been a ton of exciting research on our part too. Um, you know, something we're really passionate about. Yeah. So Andrew and I have been running fermentation classes for about 10 years now in Toronto and have taught thousands of people how to ferment. And tonight we're gonna to show you how to make a dilly kraut. Hopefully some of you have been able to use the recipe card and gather the ingredients as well. Um, if you're fermenting along with us, the only thing that we have out right now is our equipment and our ingredients, our cabbage, our dill and our cucumber and our salt. Um, if you're not fermenting along with us and you're planning to make it later, um, that's wonderful too. Um, as we ferment tonight, we're trying to give you a bit of a taste of what the continuing education course would be like in that we're going to ferment something step by step. And as we make this ferment, I'll talk a little bit about the health benefits. And for me, 
Andrew and I got into fermentation long before I studied nutrition, but as I became a nutritionist and then got really interested in the role that traditionally fermented foods play in health, I really started diving into the microbiome and how fermented foods interact with our bodies. Tonight, I'll talk a little bit about the health benefits of fermented foods like krauts, as well as how to integrate them into the diet, when to eat them, what conditions they best benefit, which would be something that we would be doing in each session during the, the course, which we're so excited about. Um, we're gonna make things together step by step. So we'll begin with one stage. We'll cover everything that's happening in that stage of that ferment process. And then we'll pause and make sure that everybody has a chance to catch up and address any questions about that stage. And then we'll continue on to the next one. Please don't feel like you need to rush. I think, and Andrew would probably agree with me, something that's really wonderful about fermentation is it gives you some time to really connect with what you're doing, <laughs> to connect with the microbes around you and to make transformation happen, which for us is a joyous process. So have fun tonight. Yeah, from the beginning, from cutting your, your cabbage to the size you want to watching it ferment. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so we're going to start getting our area prepped. Um, so we've got our cutting board out, our knife out, and we have our cabbage. A couple of things I'll just say about cabbage. Um, when we're choosing a cabbage to ferment, and this is maybe not something that you can do right now because you've already gotten your cabbage, but just for the future, some tips in terms of cabbages for fermentation. One thing that you want to buy is a cabbage that looks fairly fresh, so no visible signs of mold on it. You also want to choose a cabbage that's somewhat heavy, and that's telling you that there's still water weight in it, which is an indicator that it's fresh. A cabbage that's lighter, equivalent to a, a cabbage that's a similar size, might be an indicator that it's not as fresh anymore. And then what we want to do in terms of cleaning our cabbage, um, most people when they clean a cabbage, that simply means removing the outer leaves. The very outer leaves from the cabbage, you're going to set them aside and those can go in your compost bin. Once you get to the leaves on the inside, you're gonna take away another leaf, a clean leaf from the inside and set it aside, we'll use that later. Then for the cabbage itself, um, we've got a green cabbage, purple cabbage also works well. There's also very um, many different types of cabbages, of course, savoy and other types of cabbage. For this particular ferment, I do prefer a green or a purple cabbage. It tends to keep a little bit more crunchiness in the end, which is really nice in this particular recipe for dilly kraut. Um, once you've got your cabbage, we're gonna take the cabbage and cut it in half from the root end to the top of the head. And we'll just cut that directly in half. Now, if you've got a very large cabbage, because obviously cabbages come in lots of different sizes, um, you might choose to quarter it. Our cabbage is on the medium side, so we'll just keep it as a half. Then we wanna start cutting the cabbage into slices, starting from the top of the cabbage or the top of the head towards that root end. So we're just gonna start to make really thin slices with the knife. And again, if it's a smaller cabbage, you might be cutting the half. If it's a really big cabbage or you have a smaller knife, then quarter it and then start to slice that cabbage thinly. So your slicing is sort of taster's preference. Um, we really prefer really thin slices, but if you think you prefer a thicker slice, then go ahead and, and you can cut yourself a thicker slice, but we really go quite fine. Mm -hmm. yeah. And as Andrew's slicing, um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, choosing the cabbage, washing the cabbage, organic versus non-organic, which um, Doris, those are some fantastic questions that you sent along. So really, I love questions, so that's wonderful. Um, in terms of cabbage, um, because we're removing the outer leaves before we cut it, you don't necessarily need to wash it. And that's how most people clean their cabbage. Um, if we were using something like later on, our cucumbers in the ferment, I do wash the outside of the cucumber or something where I'm using the outer bits of it. And that's just because people have touched it in the store, there might be debris on it, and I want to remove that. 
In terms of fermentation, um, Doris had sent this lovely question about if it's non-organic, what happens to the pesticides during fermentation? And actually, pesticides can be neutralized during the fermentation process. And that's something that's called bioremediation. Um, and that's literally the microbes breaking down the pesticides and neutralizing them into something non-toxic, which is something that's pretty incredible about the fermentation process and also hints at the benefit of having these microbes internally in our systems as well, this ability to do bioremediation. Um, however, there are, of course, many different types of pesticides and herbicides and fungicides that are put on food. Um, and in general, I prefer to support types of farming, but don't use those aesides. Um, we generally try to buy organic or low spray for all of our produce. Um, and certainly, I think one of the things that's really wonderful about learning how to ferment foods is that it is such a great way to preserve things. Um, so because if we say have a farm that we really like to get our cabbages from that's nearby and they have fantastic, you know, well-produced cabbages, it's an opportunity to get many while they're in season and then to be able to ferment them to enjoy that freshness for the rest of the year until they're in season again. Now, Andrew's just adding that cabbage to the large bowl. And for us, there's a couple things that are important to talk about with salt when it comes to fermenting. Now, as you're putting your chopped cabbage or sliced cabbage into the bowl, we are going to eventually start to add some salt to our sliced cabbage. Now, for salt that works well for fermentation, really any salt can be used for fermenting and salt plays a couple roles in fermentation of vegetables. One thing that the salt does is it helps to draw the water out of the cabbage and that's going to create our brine and a brine is absolutely essential for fermenting vegetables. It's an anaerobic or an oxygen free fermentation and we create that environment by making this liquid cover the vegetable and brine just means salty water. The other thing that salt does is it helps to inhibit an enzyme that would start to break the cells of the vegetable down. The more salt that you use, the crunchier the vegetables stay. The other thing that salt is also beneficial for is it creates a favorable environment for our fermenting microbes. And the fermenting microbes that really have center stage when we're talking about vegetables is the lactobacillus family. And they're going to be the ones that create the lactic acid, which starts to create that sour flavor in fermentation. And it's the acids that actually preserve fermented foods. Now with salt, we generally use sea salts. Um, and what I like with using sea salts is because they're generally higher in trace mineral content and acidic environments help our bodies to assimilate minerals, I think it's ideal to use sea salts because you get that added benefit of being able to, to, to actually take in those minerals and the salt a little bit better in that context of the ferment. The other thing that I like about using sea salts is they've been minimally processed and many types of table salts and kosher salts will have anti-clumping agents to them. And some of those anti-clumping agents can sometimes inhibit fermentation. So ideally a, a natural sea salt, um, but any type of salt will work in a pinch. Now, in terms of salt, Andrew and I are really, really big, big advocates for salting to your taste. And that's because if we were to just use a measurement like a teaspoon, if you're using a fine teaspoon or excuse me, a fine sea salt, that's going to be a lot more salt in that teaspoon than if you were using a coarse grained salt. And so any recipe where you're using volume with salt is tricky. And because not everybody has a kitchen scale at home, this is where salting to taste is important. Um, I'm going to take about a teaspoon of salt and I'm going to start sprinkling it over that sliced cabbage. And with that salt, it's a whole head of cabbage and it's going to get diluted in the water that's pulled out from the cabbage to make the brine. 
a teaspoon is not a lot, and I'll probably end up adding at least one to two more. But I'm going to let Andrew just start to just massage that salt to distribute it throughout. And you can do the same, starting with about a teaspoon of salt, sprinkling it over top, and just beginning to massage it in. Yeah, and as we do this, the salt penetrates the cabbage and it starts to release the water inside the cabbage. And that's what we're looking for. We, we need to release some of that water so we can create our brine. And Sarah, no, our, ours is a non-iodized sea salt. It's just a natural, unprocessed sea salt. Um, but if, if that's what you have, an iodized sea salt, that will work just fine. Yeah, we've done it before in a pinch where we've used iodized. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when you're massaging, you're massaging pretty hard. You, you're like... You know, your friends just come home from a hard day at work and they need their shoulders rubbed. They're really tense. Get in there. Yeah, get in there and like <laughs> really massage. Like give it a good, hard, like sort of go at it and keep doing it. And it's beginning to get a little bit softer as the salt penetrates the cabbage. Do you want to add a little bit more? So we'll add another teaspoon here. And as you begin to massage the salt into the sliced cabbage, you will start to feel that your hands get a little bit wet. And that's the salt already beginning to pull the water out of the cabbage. And we want to help that process by starting to really rub that salt into the cabbage. And this is probably the most important step in making any kraut style ferment. It's massaging the salt in so that you create enough brine to make that anaerobic environment, which is what we need when we're fermenting. And what we wanna do is essentially massage that salt into the cabbage until we have an actual puddle of water at the bottom of our bowls. And this takes a little bit of time. I always joke I'm a movement teacher as well. And for me, when I'm massaging the cabbage, I start to think about how good that is for my grip strength and for the strength <laughs> of my forearm. So I can do something like downward dog, but you can think of it like a little workout for your fingers, your wrists, your yeah. forearms, your arms. Like a stress ball. It's like a, it's like a, it's like a kraut stress ball. And I think this is often the step that many people don't spend enough time on, or maybe they um, kind of jump ahead to the next stage before they actually have that puddle of brine. And it is absolutely essential for preventing mold in our ferment before we go on to the next stage. So you do really want to, to rub this. Um, traditionally in Eastern Europe, they would often put sliced cabbage like this into a large barrel and people similarly to making wine in Italy would actually take their shoes off and use their feet because then you're getting your whole body weight into it. So it, it is actually a, quite a bit of quite a bit of work yeah. to, to get that I done. Mean, who doesn't also want a little bit of feet in their kraut? We're not doing that today. <laughs> so the cabbage is starting to glisten and it's starting to shrink in the bowl. There's less sort of space taken up by it. So it is starting to release some of the water. And this is generally a good stage to take a little piece of cabbage out and taste it for salt. Yeah, so. I always say you want it to be saltier than how you would salt your food. Mm -hmm. um, so right now, that feels under-seasoned to me. So I would suggest another teaspoon. Okay. Um, I'm not getting a, a, a good, a big salt bite. So I do want the salt to be a prominent flavor. You wanna taste the salt. And as you, as you ferment and you create these lactic acids that preserve our kraut, they kind of, um, help balance the, the saltiness. So you've got that acid and salt balance. Mm -hmm. And then someone's asked a question about uh, doshas uh, for Ayurveda and sour fiber. Certainly when we're talking about fermented vegetables, um, and especially things like kraut style ferments, the flavor will have 
actually a number of different elements that it hits. The salt, of course, that we're adding, the sourness that's created from the acidity during fermentation, but also when we're fermenting cabbage, there's a lot of sweetness involved as well because mm -hmm. cabbage is quite sweet and many vegetables are sweet and a lot of the enzymatic reactions that happen during fermentation will actually help to create more volatile aromatics. They bring out more flavor. Um, if you have someone who reacts, so someone with a strong pita dosha that reacts to a lot of that sour, what you can do is temper that by the types of herbs that you add to your kraut. Um, tonight we're making a dilly kraut. I absolutely love dill for digestive benefits. Um, but you could also consider putting in fennel. I think fennel would be a lovely choice oh, for yeah. pitta. And you could do that with fennel seeds, but also fennel also has these beautiful green fronds. And that would be a really lovely addition to a kraut, is to do a fennel frond, fennel seed kraut. And that would be lovely for a, a pitta dosha. Okay, so I'm going to try and show you here, because I've got a good amount of water or brine on the bottom of our bowl. In there, I think you can see that there's, um, that's our brine so that we've pulled out of the cabbage and that's what we're looking for. Now, generally, it might take a little bit of time to get to this stage. Um, if, if you don't have a puddle of water yet at the bottom of your bowl, don't panic, just keep massaging. Um, I'm going to start to talk a little bit more about some of the process of fermentation and why it's beneficial for nutrition. Um, so for those of you who still don't have that puddle of brine, please continue massaging as you listen so that we all start to get to the same stage together. Um, so when we are doing this fermentation process, as I mentioned, it's the lactobacillus family, which are generally the ones that are most involved in fermenting vegetables. And the lactobacillus family is, of course, a big family. There's many different species within the lactobacillus strains, and they will create lactic acid. And that lactic acid is what ultimately preserves the cabbage. But that process is also creating breakdown of the actual vegetables themselves. Um, so for example, when we're talking about our cabbage, there's a lot of different starches within that cabbage, and some of those can be really difficult to break down in the body. Things like our FODMAPs, they actually get reduced during the fermentation process. And one of the things that for me is just such, a, such an obvious one is certain types of foods, certainly our brassicas, our alliums, they're very beneficial. We know they're really fantastic for liver health. They've got good anti-cancer properties, but they're also difficult to digest. And I'm sure I am not the only one where if I were to imagine eating a bowl of raw cabbage or raw onion or garlic, I might be in a bit of digestive distress. And that's because they're difficult for the body to break down. What's fantastic in fermentation is the microbes actually start to pre-digest. They break down a lot of the elements in the vegetable, making it easier for us to digest. And what's beneficial in that is not only that it's easier on the digestion, but also then those nutrients become easier for our body to assimilate. And we know that if we compare, say, a bowl of uh, coleslaw, raw cabbage, versus a bowl of fermented cabbage like kraut, there's an increase in antioxidants, there's an increase in glutathione, there's an increase in NAD, and other types of antioxidant nutrients because the fermentation process helps to liberate them. And that, for me, is something that's really important because it's not just whether or not a food is healthy, it's also whether or not our body is able to pull in the nutrients that make that food healthy. And that's something that fermentation does really well. We're also trapping in the vitamin C that's available when we ferment. So as you pull a plant from the ground, your vitamin C starts to uh, decrease as, as it's away from being, you know, a live plant. And so as soon as we ferment it, we, we lock in that vitamin C that is available. Mm -hmm. The other thing that's also interesting in fermentation is that new nutrients are also made. Um, so certainly during the fermentation of uh, kraut, extra B 
vitamins will be made. There's also a number of anti-inflammatory acids. Um, so we have our lactic acid, which is part of the preservation of the vegetable itself, but we also have other types of anti-inflammatory acids. And these are also rich in foods like homemade uh, vinegars. We also see it in things like homemade, um, this is some homemade kefir, uh, homemade kombucha would also be very high in these anti-inflammatory acids, which are excellent for people who have any type of joint inflammation or other inflammatory conditions. Um, the other thing, of course, with fermented foods is that we're creating probiotic organisms. And one of the things that I think can be a real misconception is what it means to consume probiotic organisms. So we're going to spend a, quite a bit of time breaking this down in, in the Con Ed course as well, because I think there's um, just a lot of misinformation in terms of what happens when we eat these probiotic organisms. Um, we're going to just pause and check in and just make sure that we're all kind of at a similar stage now in that we've got our brine. trout chopped up with some brine on the bottom. Excellent. Yeah. Right. Now, for awesome Antonina, yay, hi. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now for next stages. So we're gonna start to get our, our kraut prep for next stages, and then we'll come back to talking about the probiotics that we're making. Um, we've, for the recipe, uh, for the kind of standard dilly kraut recipe that we're making, we have some cucumbers that we're gonna chop, and then we have our fresh dill. If you want to make substitutions, you're absolutely welcome to. Um, so mm -hmm. if you, yeah, Fatima, hi. <laughs> if you would like to add fennel seeds or dill seeds, that's also lovely. Um, certainly one thing that we find is that when we're using dried herbs and spices and dried seeds, a little just go a long way. Mm -hmm. So start with a small amount, add it now, let it kind of sit there for a few minutes, let the flavors melt and then taste it. You can always add more, but even a small amount of dried herb usually like really permeates the whole kraut. It can be overpowering if you do too much. Especially when we're looking at coriander, uh, cardamom, that really flowery flavor comes through with just a few pods. Mm -hmm. um, for those who are adding the fresh dill and the cucumber, my recommendation is to begin with the dill and you can mince it, you can chop it however you like. And I generally like to add the dill first so that I can really distribute it and get a sense of the flavor. So I really massage it in, get it all mixed up. The cucumbers, of course, are more uh, delicate. You could bruise them. I generally add them last just to toss them in. And we love dill. So we go all in with the dill. Yeah, we don't hold back. Yeah. <laughs> The other thing that um, we'll talk about in the con ed course too is uh, dehydrating your ferments. Uh, so in this jar here, I have some fermented kimchi powder, uh, kimchi that we made and then dehydrated and ground it up into a powder. This dilly kraut recipe is a fantastic one to do that with because you get dill pickle seasoning, which is amazing on so many things. It's ridiculous, oh. including my finger in the jar onto my tongue. Right. <laughs> Um, yeah, and I mean, you don't have to worry of, with your herbs, you don't have to worry about the stalks because through the fermentation process, those things, they're going to become quite uh, soft. Yeah. Yeah. And Katie, if you've got other fresh herbs, thyme, basil, oregano, parsley, cilantro, all, all sound great. Um, choose the ones that you like the flavor of the best and the ones where you know that their flavors meld well together. Um, so, you know, from that list, I would really like parsley with oregano, you know, you know what you like. Basil can be mm -hmm. really nice, sometimes even on its own. Um, and I always think about, too, is this a kraut that I'm making to eat on its own as a condiment when I have a meal? Or is this a kraut that I want to use in other types of recipes? Like, am I going to be putting this in my fresh salads? Am I going to use this to mix with, say, an egg salad? How am I serving this kraut? So that might also tell you what types of herbs or flavors that you might want to toss in there. Mm -hmm. And uh, where, where Catherine definitely comes through to fermentation with the nutritional aspects of things. I mean, you love to cook too, but 
um, I love being in the kitchen and I like exploring new directions and fermentation was, was that for me. And so I tend to apply the flavors that I like, say when I'm making a curry, I just sort of say, how can I make that into a ferment? How can I make that into a kraut? Mm -hmm. So if there's flavors that you love that you combine already in your salads and in your stir fries or, or in your other cooking, try and apply that to, mm -hmm. to your kraut and it becomes very versatile. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And you can also do that with a nutritional angle to it too, in that I really like fresh herbs now in the spring especially as we're merging into summer, my palate's changing to the flavor of fresh herbs. Whereas generally the krauts that I'm making in the fall will have curry spices in it. Right. It will have ginger, it will have turmeric, it will have more of that sort of winter palate, but also the types of winter spices that would be going along with the types of foods that I would be serving or eating it with. Um, do you want just these cucumbers or do you want to add another one or two? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've caught and caught with my hand in pickle jars too, I, especially in Andrew's limited ferments when I steal them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's true. They're precious. <laughs> All right. So uh, we've got our, we've got baby cucumbers. Um, so you're just going to cut them into bite-sized pieces. Um, so, you know, chop them, quarter them, however you like to do it, slices. It's nice to have uh, a variety of textures too. So you've got the dill, the, the cucumber will be a little softer than the cabbage. Um, so I, I like to have a little bit chunkier sizes of um, cucumbers. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have other veggies that you're adding, I saw someone ask whether or not they could put carrot in. Yeah, of course mm -hmm. you can put other vegetables in as well. Not all vegetables ferment well on their own. And sometimes that's because they don't naturally have a lot of the lactobacillus species that we need for fermentation. Sometimes it's because they're very high in sugar. Something like tomatoes don't actually ferment very well in terms of a vegetable style of ferment like this because their sugar content is too high. However, you can make an amazing vinegar out of it. Tomato vinegar is quite lovely, but that's a different process than what vegetable fermentation is. Um, but because we have our cabbage and that's introducing the bacteria that's getting the fermentation going, you could add any other vegetable that you like at this point. Um, mm -hmm. um, however, I'm, I'm no longer massaging it because I've added in the cucumber. I'm just sort of folding it and tossing it together because mm -hmm. I don't want to crush up these delicate cucumbers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, have you tried it? No. Okay, give it a try. See where we're at. Oh, and so the saltiness level is there. Mm -hmm. it, it's very, it, it's not too much, but it's there. And the sweetness of the cabbage really comes through. Once it's salted, it sort of starts to become really sweet. Mm -hmm. I mean, I could, I think I could you eat could this right now. Salt. You could even add a bit more salt. Yeah, yeah. okay, let's add some more salt. Mm -hmm. But then of course, you know, Catherine would have gas and <laughs> yeah, we're gonna ferment it first. We're gonna ferment it first. But it tastes pretty good <laughs> as it is right now. Like it, it tastes pretty good. Now um with the ferment, um, we're gonna in the course really break down different things that we can add in terms of flavors, different spices, different types of nutrients, and how they transform. Um one thing though that's a good one just to note in terms of uh, flavor is because this is going to end up creating brine, that brine is gonna dilute some of those flavors as well. Um, so I've just added a bit more salt. I like it to be a little salty to the taste because in the end, some of that salt will be lost in the brine as well. So that's also why we're getting on the, on the salty side of things. Mm -hmm. And you know, I know, Sometimes there's concerns about eating too much salt, but um, for this two liters of sauerkraut, we've added three to four teaspoons of salt. So, and at the end of the day, it's, it's a minimal amount of, of salt. Mm -hmm. And I feel like those concerns probably come from processed crap anyway, so. Um, so uh, yes, Himalayan sea salt would be perfectly fine. So yeah, it's a good option. 
Um, so we're going to start to move on to the next stage, which is jarring it so that it, it can ferment in a vessel. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about containers that we can use for fermentation um, and what's important in terms of packing it into the container. We just have a, a mason jar here, a canning jar. A wide, wide mouth. And a wide mouth for me, I find that it's preferable. It's a little bit easier to fit a weight on the top. It's also for me, my hands small enough that I can get inside to, to pack things down. I find that convenient, but any type of glass jar will work. If you only have a narrow mouth canning jar, that's also fine. Yeah. Um, you could even you know, recycle, reuse a jar that held spaghetti sauce. As long as it's been cleaned with hot water, that's perfectly fine. Hmm. In canning, things need to be sterilized. This is not canning, this is fermenting, as long as they're clean, as long as they're sanitary. So hot water, soap, glass jar is preferable. The reason that we like to ferment in glass is because it's inert. Because of ferment will get quite acidic, we're gonna go under a four on the pH scale. That's acidic enough to break plastics down. We don't like to ferment in plastics. We don't like to buy fermented foods that are sold in plastics because that's generally going to break down and some of the toxics in plastics can then leach into the food. You can also use ceramics, however, Many ceramics are treated with glazes that aren't meant to handle acidic environments. So a you know a decorative ceramic container that's maybe meant to hold sugar or I don't know what else cookies, cookies. <laughs> is not going to be good for fermentation because the acidic environment that you're creating might break that glaze down. It would have to be a uh, a, a, a glaze that's been designed to handle acidic environments, a, a ceramic container meant for fermentation. Um, so for today, I think glass would be, would be ideal. And when you start to pack into the container, what's important is that we get rid of any big spaces. We don't want to have air pockets. Again, this is an anaerobic or an oxygen-free ferment. Um, so we want to make sure that we minimize that. Andrew's going to begin to pack things in, and if you don't have this, that's fine, but if you happen to have a canning funnel, um, it does make it easier. It's a little bit less cleanup, especially if you have a narrower top. So if you've got a canning funnel, you could use it. Otherwise, just starting to pack it in. And Andrew's just going to do, you know, a, about halfway up and then pause and then start to tamp down. So we have this muller. Um, but you can use the end of a wooden spoon. You can use something that has some sort of base to it. You can just start squishing down your out so that we're uh, getting all the air spaces out of it. And we're going to have a look at it. You know, we'll hold it up to the light when we're done to make sure that we've got all of those air spaces out of it. And you can really cram, really just cram it in. And then we'll start adding a bit more. Yeah, and Megan, if you want to add minced garlic or crushed garlic, absolutely. Oh, yeah. If you want a garlic dilly crow, oh, yeah. that is really tasty as well. Yeah. Definitely. Um, we've done it before. For some reason, we we're, for our dilly crow, we just usually do just uh, cucumber and dill, but obviously, Garlic, gar garlic, garlic is is like super nice. A great pairing for this. Yes. Um, so Andrew's just tapping down, getting rid of any air pockets. And if you're on the stage two and you're you're tamping down, you'll notice that as you press down, it also starts to push the brine level up, and that's also something that's important with this tamping. We're getting rid of air pockets, but we're also encouraging the brine to lift up and submerge the crow. Yeah, a muller is like a, I'm, I'm just calling it a tamper. I think generally when it's a blender, sometimes call the attachment to push things down and tamper, you tamp it back down, but it can be whatever. It could be the back of a spoon that you're using. Um, can be your hand too. It can be your hand if it fits inside the jar as well. Absolutely. 
And you want to fill not all the way to the top because we do need to leave some room at the top for a follower and a weight. Generally, we leave at least an inch of room between the top of the vegetables and the liquid and the rim of your jar. So I'll just bring this up and we can see we've got a nice amount of brine in there. And the idea is that all of the vegetable sits underneath that brine. Mm -hmm. And our follower will help us do that. Now, followers, that's essentially the name that we give to something that's going to hold tiny pieces down. Um, so little pieces of dill that are floating, or if we've added some fennel seeds to it, fennel seeds, things like that could pop up. And then they become a little island floating on top. And that can become a home for a mold spore to land on. Mold will only happen in a ferment if it has an aerobic environment, oxygen. It needs oxygen to live. And so by using a follower, you, you help to eliminate little islands where mold spores can land on. And follower in this case can be the reserved cabbage leaf that we set aside at the beginning, um, which generally uh, we just take the end of it and make it roughly to the size of the jar. And then we just push it down inside so that it covers the kraut but it allows the brine to come up over top. Yeah, and the, the corners that fold up, you can uh, fold them in and cover it, so. And lots of different vegetables can work as a follower. Um, cabbage is dense enough to use as a follower. You can also use the top of leek. Um, so the, the green ends of leek that aren't edible, you can use that as the top. Um, generally, though, things that are softer, like a lettuce leaf wouldn't work, it's going to disintegrate in the acidic environment. Mm -hmm. um, you could use something like a collard leaf or a kale leaf, but you might need to swap them out every couple of days because oh. they will tend to break down a little bit. I was just going to say don't use well. kale. <laughs> You'll have to kale, swap it out. Kale tends to break down. Mm -hmm. Now, once you've got the follower, now we need a weight to keep everything submerged. And there's a few different options for weight. Generally, the one that we like the best that's low tech, that's really accessible, is to just use a smaller jar that fits inside the rim of the jar that you're using. Um, so for example, if you have a wide mouth canning jar, a narrow sized um, 125 mil jar will fit inside that wide mouth. And that's generally what we used for years as our weight. And Andrew can go hold that up in front of the camera just so it's easy to see. So that's just a little small, mason jar, canning jar, inside the bigger one. And that just fits on top. And you can see it. as I push that down, the liquid comes up. So that helps the liquid sit above all of our veg. Um, okay. Yeah, lots you, of questions. Do we want so we're gonna one? adjust, we're gonna... Um, okay. The glass ball. Yeah. So there are also products that you can get that can make this easier. Um, and these are glass fermenting stones. And there's a lot of different brands that make them. Um, and they act as both your follower and your weight. You can get them for narrow sized jars or wide mouth jars. And they fit just inside the rim of the container, which is really nice because then you don't need to have a follower and a weight that you create every time. They just fit inside and you use that instead. And they're heavy enough, they're thick enough that it helps to weigh that ferment down. Yeah, so those are really cool. And we ferment a lot. They are, um, they're really helpful. They're really helpful. Yeah, and there's all sorts of brands. Um, pickle, Sour stones, pickle pebbles. Pickle pucks. Yeah. Um, glass fermentation weights. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and for that matter, you can also go outside, get a stone, a nice round flat stone that's going to fit inside there, boil it so you can kill anything off that's on it. And then you can use that mm -hmm. as your fermentation weight too. So you can just use a stone. Mm -hmm. As long as you boil it for 10 minutes, it works really well. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great fermentation weight. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so a couple questions that have come in. Um, so in terms of the uh, adding water, no, don't add water because there's a lot of water inside the cabbage and the cucumber. And as this sits here over the next 24 hours, 48 hours, the salt's gonna continue to pull water out of the vegetables. If you added water now, you're gonna end up having an overflow and that's gonna further dilute then your salt ratios because then you're releasing more water and you've added extra water. Um, generally, if you don't have enough liquid yet, I would say massage a little longer, let it rest for an hour or so, let the salt do its thing, come back, massage it again in your bowl and then tamp it in. The other thing that you can also do is once you get it in your jar, if you really push down on your weight, sometimes that helps to lift the brine up over top of, uh, uh, over top of your kraut. Mm -hmm. um, so give it a little more time, massage a little bit more, push down on your weight. But I would say don't add water at this stage. The only time I would add water to a kraut is if I've already been fermenting it for weeks and then because of evaporation, I've lost brine levels. And then I would add brine, salty water, so that I'm not messing with that salt ratio. Right, we don't want the salinity to decrease. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing we didn't really check, which I said we would, is looking at the jar and turning it around and looking for any air pockets that might be in there. And if you find an air pocket, you can take, take your tamping tool and just press down on it and try and get that, that um, air pocket to release. So we're looking pretty good here because I packed that really tight. So there's no air bubbles in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Katie, for uh, followers, it can be any kind of stiff vegetable. Um, so this is like cabbage leaves work really well as followers for any type of vegetable ferment. Uh, the ends of leek work really well, you kind of unfold them, put them on top. Um, generally though, things that don't work so well are things that are really thin that are gonna break down easily, like a romaine lettuce leaf won't work well. Collard is okay. Um, denser types of kale, like dinosaur kale are okay. Right. You just might need to replace it depending on how long you're letting it ferment if it starts to get mushy. Um, you could use a slice of onion if, but you are going to then incorporate onion flavor into your ferment. But um, if you just cut a slice of onion and use that as your follower too, that's, uh, that's mm -hmm. a good, uh, a good if, if, you're good, if you're okay with the onion flavor being incorporated <laughs> into your uh, ferment. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then there's a question about floating dills. Yeah, Kimberly, good question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So we've got some little dill leaves that are floating up on the top and that's gonna be really hard to prevent. This is where it's really important to understand that everything that's underneath our brine is perfectly safe because it is anaerobic. So only the microorganisms that are doing the fermentation for us under here are thriving. Once we create this little island on the top where a mold spore could land, you could have a little bit of mold form on that say floating dill leaf that's on the top. And if that happened, you just take that little piece of dill with the mold on it out and everything under the brine is perfectly safe. Mm -hmm. But you can like as much as you can, because it'll be a bit tedious, but you can remove some of those floaties and, mm -hmm. and get them out of there. And then in terms of airlocks, good questions. Yeah, so we could do an airlock or uh, a closed style of top. So we're gonna talk about tops now. Um, so there's a couple different options. Um, so one is that you use a clean napkin and a rubber band. And it doesn't even, you can just sort of put that over the top. And the purpose of covering it over the top is so that you don't get fruit flies or dust or something landing in there. Um, so clean napkin over the top. Of course, if you have a, a weight inside, then your napkin might be lifted up over the top. That's perfectly fine. You could also put a lid on this while it ferments, and that would also keep dust and fruit flies out. However, during the fermentation process, we're also gonna be creating carbon dioxide. And so if we have the lid on tight, that carbon dioxide is building pressure inside the jar. 
which means that every day or so you'll have to burp your ferment, which is literally just opening it, unsealing the lid to let that CO2 escape. Then you can have airlock systems, which um, grab a pickle pipe, I guess, but it just allows the carbon dioxide to release. We generally don't use that um, method of an airlock unless we're doing something like a really long ferment, like our chili paste. Um, so this is something that we ferment often for months before it's done fermenting, which because evaporation is more of an issue than with brine and uh, more of an issue with mold because it's a paste. Um, then we will go to an airlock system. For this, we don't because it's a shorter ferment and because I wanna taste it often as it's fermenting so that I can stop it at the type of crunch level and the type of acidity that I want. And so at, at, at that type of ferment, then an airlock is not necessary. And it also is just cumbersome because if you're tasting it every couple of days, you're just introducing things anyways. Mm -hmm. Now, once you've got this set up, so we're just going to use the napkin method and put like a napkin, you could do like a coffee filter over top. Um, you're just going to set this aside in your kitchen now to ferment and you're just going to leave it in a cool spot of your kitchen away from direct light. Um, generally, ferments don't like big temperature changes when we're talking about vegetable ferments, so keeping it out of a window is generally ideal. And I would recommend, especially if you're new to fermenting, putting it somewhere where you're going to see it. The things that you're going to want to look for and that you're going to notice in the first few days of fermenting is, as I said, the salt's going to keep pulling water back out. We will generally put this inside like a baking dish or a bowl because probably in the next day or so you'll actually have some brine overflow over the top. The other thing that you're going to start to notice is carbon dioxide bubbles. So, you know, within about two or three days, if you were to press down on your weight, you'll see bloop, 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 bloop of carbon dioxide bubbles coming up. And that's a sign of an active ferment. That's fantastic. It's, it's where the name fermentation comes from. When, when your kitchen is on the warmer side, it will ferment faster. If your house is on the cooler side, it will ferment a little slower. For us in the summer, we might be testing this kraut on day three and it might go into our fridge on day five or six. It might be a really short ferment. When it's a little cooler, we might be letting it ferment for seven to 10 days. Mm -hmm. This is where we really say, let your taste be your guide again. What you're looking for is for that sour flavor of the acids to have developed. You want that acidity to be there because that's ultimately what's preserving the crowd. Once you've got that acidity, it's really up to you. The longer it ferments, the more the acids will start to break the vegetables down and you'll go from something that's crunchy to something that's quite soft. And some people really like soft, mushy krauts. It's not my cup of tea. I like a crunchy kraut, so my ferments tend to stay on the shorter side. Mm -hmm. I think that being said is it's like there is no definite procedure or, or time or say uh, method for your recipe when you're fermenting, it's really taster's choice. I think that's a really important thing with fermentation is you have to, you have to be involved with it. You have to taste it as it's being fermented and you stop it when you like it. So when it gets to a point where you think, yes, this is what I want it to taste like, then you go ahead and you put a lid on it and it goes into your fridge. Um, so a couple of questions. Yeah, if you have a, a shot glass or like a uh, just like a glass, water glass that fits inside, that could also be your weight that goes in. That's perfectly fine. For the garlic, I would not recommend putting garlic that's in oil in this because the oils will go rancid over time. Whereas once this is fermented and preserved in the acids, it will keep indefinitely in your fridge. You could eat it seven months from now, 12 months from now, and it's still perfectly fine. But once you introduce a fat or an oil, that's going to go rancid. It will really shorten the shelf life. Also, the oils are going to tend to, because this is quite a brined um, type of ferment, your oils are going to float up to the top and oxidize off. Yeah. And generally, their oil, oil is not involved in fermentation. We have mm -hmm. done a couple of ferments that involve mustard oil, uh, and it's very antimicrobial, and it acts to um, keep 
the environment uh, habitable for the bacteria that we do want. Mm -hmm. So there are a couple that use oil, but de generally, yeah, definitely oil is not a part of a vegetable. fermenting vegetables, yeah. for vegetable fermentation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so in terms of the top, if as long as you have enough room for your weight, it's okay if you're closer to the top, but if you're, if you don't have enough room for your weight and for the brine to be above it, then you might need to fill a second jar up with yeah. what's left or put it in the fridge and eat it as a coleslaw tomorrow, yeah. <laughs> unfermented. Um, so once, once it's got that acidity and you're transferring it to the fridge, then you can take away your weight, remove your follower, seal it tightly. Once it's in the fridge, the cooler temperature of the fridge slows the ferment down. So you'll retain that flavor for a few months. It is still slowly fermenting. So it will still get softer and softer over time as it sits in the fridge. We generally prefer to consume this within about two to three months. Yeah. That said, if you find it in the back of your fridge <laughs> nine months from now, dill pickle powder and everyone's a winner. So yeah. really, no, nothing lost there. Um, okay, so I'm just checking questions here. Can you tap the jar to settle the air? Yeah, definitely. So you can give it a tap like this and that'll help bring up some of the air pockets mm -hmm. as well. Um, and what's the longest time you can ferment for? You could keep fermenting this until you consume it. Um, so certainly for many people, especially if they like really sour flavors and softer textures to their krauts, they might never put it in the fridge. They might let it ferment for several weeks and then just start to eat it a forkful at a time, leaving it at room temperature that entire time. Um, so, so there is no uh, rule on having to put it in the fridge. We do it to start to slow the ferment so that we can retain some of the crunch that's in it. Yeah, and traditionally, we, you wouldn't have a fridge. You would just have a barrel full of sauerkraut. And as you eat it, you know, by the time you get to the bottom of the barrel, um, that's a really sour, really fermented sauerkraut, but it's just, it has never been refrigerated. So traditionally, I mean, we wouldn't have had refrigerators. Yeah, and you do want, um, for fermentation, they need to be at room temperature to ferment. If you were to take this and put it in the fridge right now, it doesn't have the acids to preserve it. It would be like putting coleslaw in your fridge. It'll only keep for a few days and then it's gonna go off. We need to ferment it at room temperature, let the acids develop once it's fermented, that's a preservation technique, now you can put it in the fridge and then it's perfectly fine. fine mm -hmm. to keep. And uh, something else you'll notice with this, right now the colors are really vibrant. They're, they're really green and the cabbage is, has got a nice white color. As it ferments, that's going to go away. It's going to become more dull. So as the acids build up uh, and they'll take away some of that color, you'll get a uh, cloudier, duller color. So that's another sign to look for is that there's a color change. Mm -hmm. No, so once it goes in the fridge, fermentation slowed down, but it doesn't stop. We would need to freeze it to stop fermentation, or we would need to pasteurize it to apply heat to stop the fermentation. In the fridge, it's only slowed down. Now, in terms of once we eat it, um, so there's nothing, um, there's nothing wrong with a shorter ferment versus a medium-like ferment versus a really long old ferment. The acid level is changing a little bit over time. Um, so at the beginning of a ferment, certain types of species of microbes will be more active. In the middle of a ferment, other species will become more active. Mm -hmm. Once they've completely run out of food, they will start to die off. You know, a, a kraut that's been in your fridge for two years probably doesn't have a lot of living organisms in it anymore. However, in terms of thinking about eating fermented foods and the nutritional benefits. Um, so when we're eating a fermented food, um, we're taking in those organisms, those probiotic organisms, and part of the benefit that they have is stimulating our immune system. And that doesn't necessarily mean that that probiotic needs to be alive. It's often the shape of the organism that stimulates the immune system, which means that even if you had a really old kraut, and the probiotics were dead, or if you took this kraut and you fried it before you ate it, 
you're still getting the benefit of the shapes of those organisms that benefits your immune health. In terms of digestion, the probiotics that are in here also have a transitory benefit, and that's where we do want them to be alive. And what that means is as they move through your body, they help you to digest the other things that you're eating. So this is where I really like having a small amount of a fermented food. Think of it like a condiment, not a whole bowl of kraut, but having a couple forkfuls, forkfuls with the rest of your meal, and that will help you digest everything else. And you can have that with the meal, ahead of your meal, does it, you know, be right, right at the beginning of eating, doesn't really matter. As you're digesting that food, it's going to help you to break down the other things that you're eating. And for that, we do want living organisms. And for that, I think there's a real, real benefit to being able to enhance digestion by the regular consumption of fermented foods. And when we look at traditional um, history of humans, often 40% of what was on our plate, roughly, would have been fermented. And so to, to think about how can I add fermented foods when I'm eating is something that I think is really beneficial because we've co-evolved to use them to help us digest. And this is also why we've got such a you know, smorgasbord of different types of ferments here. We really like to ferment a lot of different things. So it becomes really easy and intuitive to add it. Um, so we have chili paste, we make hot sauces. We love to have chili paste on hand in the fridge so that we can make different hot sauces whenever we kind of feel like it. Or if we have some mango left over and we want to make a mango chili mm -hmm. hot sauce, we've got this ready to go. And that's just already fermented and this smells is fantastic. Some age, this is a one and a half year old chickpea miso that we made. So it fermented for a year. And I think what's great about this, it's going to be hard to see but there's liquid on top of this, and that is tamari. So that's where tamari comes from, pressed miso. Um, and this is made from chickpeas. We love the, we love chickpea miso. It has a fantastic flavor. Reminis reminiscent of um, Parmesan a little bit, actually. Yeah, and then this is some vinegar. So vinegar is another thing that we often make and it makes it really easy to have fermented foods daily because of course they can be part of dressings, marinades, so easy to use vinegar. Yes, that's a peach vinegar from last year. Um, okay, so some questions. So yeah, so during the um, Con Ed course, each session will be focusing on a different types of ferments. So from doing drinks like kefir and kombucha and vinegars to all kinds of vegetable ferments, whole ferments like radishes or green beans, misos, koji, all kinds of different fermented foods. Um, in terms of- And we'll be, so we're gonna go over the process of, of many different ferments, but during each, each class, each section, uh, we will be producing, I think two, Two ferments. At least two. At least two ferments um, with you guys um, each 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 Sunday. Yeah, so really I think tasting as you go is just like so so fantastic to do. Um, you want to make sure that you like the flavor of what you've made. It's going to transform a little bit, aromatics will come out more the acids will start to develop, which really enhances the palate of other flavors. Um, but if you're finding that your brine right now is way too salty, I would actually probably leave it for now. More water is gonna get pulled out of your vegetables as it ferments, which will dilute it. Again, in the end, when you eat it, you'll eat it as a condiment. So this might be a, a, a kraut that you mix with other things. Maybe you put a forkful into a big bowl of salad and then just add less salt to your dressing. So there'll still be ways that you can troubleshoot serving it in the end if you do find that you over-salted it. Um, in terms of some other questions coming in, um, for me, I think um, one of the things that I love about fermented foods over probiotics is that you get more strain diversity. So whether or not we're talking about a probiotic supplement or whether or not we're talking about a bottle of kombucha or a jar of yogurt from the grocery store, once we get into commercial preparations, they have strain specificity. So they're, they're doing just a, a small collection. 
And that's in part because for probiotic supplements, it's very difficult to grow them in a laboratory. It's difficult to encapsulate them. Some of them will eat one another once they're encapsulated. It's very difficult to get them to survive the acidity and then the bile secretions. Um, so probiotic supplements, they're quite limited in strain diversity. In terms of commercially prepared um, foods at the grocery stores, like again, yogurts or kombucha, they're only doing a certain type of strains to get batch consistency. And that's why it tastes the same every single time. The benefit to fermenting food on your own is that because you're using the wild organisms that are in the air, that are on the, the vegetable or whatever it is that you're fermenting, you have much more strains. And really when we start to look at the immune benefit, strain diversity is the name of the game. Not count, so not how many there are, like 50 billion, but rather how many different strains. So lactobacillus acidophilus being one strain, um, bifido bifidum bacterium being another strain. The other thing that I think is also uh, beneficial in terms of fermented foods is that they carry with them so many other benefits. So you're getting anti-inflammatory, antioxidants, there's so many different um, nutritional benefits which are so beyond just like right now to get into. This is why we wanted to design a whole course to be able to like really get into all of it. But there's so many other benefits that come along with the food when you transform it through fermentation, from creating new nutrients to making the ones that are there easier to assimilate. I think if we were to compare taking a probiotic supplement to eating fermented foods regularly, it's hard to even make comparisons because there's so many more benefits to that fermented food. Now, that being said, um, for all cultures, fermented foods are something that we ate regularly, but they weren't the entire meal. If you're not used to eating fermented foods, I would say start small, have a fork full with a meal, that's it. Let your body get used to it, see how it does. There's also specific types of benefits, there's specific nutrients in different types of ferments. Some people might do way better with uh, kefir, some people might do way better with a miso, and there's different reasons digestively for why that might be, or why they're better suited for specific conditions. In terms of somebody who's recently had surgery or if you've had broad spectrum antibiotics, counterintuitively, I would not recommend a probiotic supplement. When the immune system is down, introducing anything to it might actually overwhelm it or cause it to attack, even friendlies like probiotic species. So generally, you want to wait, let your body uh, recover for a few months before you start to introduce something like a probiotic supplement. Catherine, yeah. Andrew, thank you very <laughs> much for everything this evening. That was wonderful. Catherine, you have just a lovely grace. I love the hand gestures and I, I just love it all. And then I love Andrew's intensity. He's just like, he listens like wildly to you. I love it. You just make such a fantastic uh, teaching pair. You really do. Everybody is saying thank you. So now when does your uh, con ed course start? I, 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 I just love it. When, when does it start? It's I think on, it's June 6, right? It's on June 6. It's the four Sundays in June from one to four Eastern time. Um, we'll be making ferments step by step each class. So a, a couple during each class. Um, each of the sessions too, it's based on things that you don't need special equipment for with ingredients that are easy to find at the grocery store, but we will also be covering special things like making miso or making your own kefir where there's starter cultures involved, which we'll be sharing our suppliers for all of that and recipes if anybody wants to also make those. Mm -hmm. um, we'll be getting really nitty gritty into the nutritional benefits and therapeutic aspects. So I'm excited to, to nerd out about that. And each <laughs> session we'll be checking in on the ferments that we made the week before. Yeah. So we get to really learn together and troubleshoot and this is what this looks like. And right. this is why it turned it different because our intention is that at the end of the course, you understand the process so much that you can go off and teach other people, make your own, really understand why you're using specific things for your body or recommending it for your client. And like, yeah. it can be weird. Fermentation can be really weird. Yeah. You know, like <laughs> we've all seen a SCOBY, I'm sure. Like yeah. they're weird looking things. Yeah. Like, and you don't know if 
you're doing it right. So, I mean, Catherine and I always bounced questions off each other when we were learning about this. And, uh, you know, we had to try and figure out, is it right? Is it, is it not? Um, so we definitely uh, go over all of that troubleshooting. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, what I really liked about speaking to the both of you um, in preparing this uh, course was the engagement with the class the next session. Where is your ferment at? What does it look like? And I remember talking to you, Catherine, and you said, no, 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 I, I want to be able to, and, and Andrew too, I want to be able to answer questions because everybody has different questions because they have different temperatures in their house they've got they've used different kinds of jars they've used different kinds of uh, everything so that's what i liked is again the engagement uh, um baljinder choker is really big on that too he's like engagement 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 i want all of you there all the time so it's very important and i would like to give you my address that you could send all of those jars on your table to me because i know that you have <laughs> lots of other ferments yeah. <laughs> and you can share but yeah. but i really appreciate your time both of you this evening setting up it's no small feat to get ready for the evening to set up and i know you've been doing this a long time and your old hat at it but nevertheless it takes time and it takes a, a nurturing character to do what you're doing and I want to thank you for that. And again, your your uh, generosity in answering questions this evening, both of you. Well, thank yeah. you, Julian. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. <laughs> okay, thank you. And everyone is saying, I don't know if Catherine, if you can look in the um, uh, in the chat and the Q and A, you're getting a you're getting a lot of love. Both. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thanks for spending part of your night with us. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Super. Okay. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> Karen, aw, hi. <laughs> there you go, lots and lots of hearts. <laughs> Very good. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, bye. Talk to you soon. Bye, Andrew. Bye, Catherine. <laughs>